Friends of God, we've been talking about this for, this is the eighth week now. We're tying a bow on it this week. As a lot of you know, I think I shared a couple stories the first, the very first week we started doing this. I like to talk about how I was, I, I grew up in a small farm town community because there's just so many funny stories that you can pull from that, that I think like not everybody experiences. But I did, I did grow up in a tiny, tiny town called Farmersville, Ohio. It's literally only 40 minutes like southeast from here, but nobody knows about it. Does anybody know Farmersville actually is a place? Oh, okay, great. A couple of people, like 15 people. That's awesome. Uh, but Farmersville is literally a town or a ville of farmers. It's awesome. I would move back there, except it's like just out of the way from literally everything. But I grew up there, and the church that I grew up in was a tiny, tiny, tiny church, and it was what a lot of you would probably call an old school church. And what I mean by that is it, it was very organized, highly liturgical, stand up, sit down, and we sang out of something called a hymnal. Anybody know what that even is anymore? Crazy idea, right? This is like this book in the back of the seat. No connect cards. It's just a hymnal of like songs that people have been singing for generations. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, but we grew up with that. And then all the kids on Sunday morning would go to Sunday school before church. And so I grew up doing all those things. And in the, in the summer, all the kids would go to VBS, which is short for Vacation Bible School, which is, I feel like it's actually kind of making a comeback in some areas, but VBS. And so you would go for three or four days. Your parents would put you in this program called VBS. And there was a theme. And you would sing songs with the theme. But if you were really, really little, like five, six, or whatever, you would just learn the basic songs. Like, our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do for you. Hey, VBS people in the house. And then, and then, of course, Jesus loves me, right? Even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably know the ending of that one. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? And so, a lot of us, even if you haven't been around church, you've heard this idea that Jesus loves you, brother. Jesus loves you, man. I have a hoodie that I wear all the time. It says Jesus loves you. And so we're told about that. And I sang about that when I was five years old. And it's awesome. But I, I, I felt like as I grew up in that, that this idea that God loves me was something that I was, I was taught. And it was a concept that I, I knew in my head, but it wasn't something that I knew or that pierced the very innermost parts of my being. Does that make any sense to you? Where, where we can know a phrase or we can hear something, but unless it happens here, it's not going to change a darn thing. Right, And I think the same thing is true about the phrase friend of God. And so that's what we've been talking about of is friend of God just like Jesus loves you? Is it just this cute saying that good Christians slap on a bumper sticker and on the rear end of their car and something that you say to maybe make somebody feel good or spiritual and get them into church? Or is it something when you say I'm a friend of God, is it something higher and greater that exists rather than just just a cute saying that makes you feel good. So that's what we've been talking about. And each week we've been talking and looking at a specific character in the Bible, looking at their story, looking at their life and saying, okay, this was Moses, Mary of Bethany, Abraham. These were people that were friends of God clearly by the way that they lived, not just by what they said or sang about or thought, but by the way that they lived. It was clear that they were a friend of God and I wanna, I wanna be that too. And so we were pulling out truths from these people, looking at their lives. And so today as we wrap up, we're going to be revisiting some of those themes, talking about the most important thing there is to know about being a friend of God. But also we're gonna be talking about someone that we haven't talked about yet. And that person is you. You as a friend of God or as a potential friend of God, I should say. You as a friend of God, us as friends of God. Because we can know the stories, but it's different when it reaches here. Amen? Let's do it. Here's what I know. I don't know a lot. You can ask my wife, but here's what I know. <laughs> I know that our God is a powerful God. 
I know that our God can heal. And I know that our God can pour out his spirit on his people still today. So I'm going to pray and ask him for those things. But here's what I'm asking from, from you. Is that you would believe with me. The very beginning of this series, we talked about leaning in this summer instead of checking out, which is what the temptation is during the summertime at church. But I'm asking that you would lean in for the last message of this series with me and saying, I too believe, not just know, but, but believe that God could change everything in my heart today. That the parts of my heart that I don't even know need healing, he could heal it because he's powerful. And I know that he can pour out his spirit on me right now. Not later, not pushing it off, but he could do it right now for you. And it has the potential to change the way that you walk out of this room. I want you to believe that with me. So let's pray. Father, I believe you're a, a good father. You're a father who sees us even when we feel like no one does. You're a father who loves us even when we feel like no one does. And you're a powerful God. One who desires to be with us and pour out his spirit on us. And we are so grateful and we don't take that casually or for granted. So we ask in the name of Jesus that you would pour out your spirit on us this morning. God, as we open up your word, it wouldn't be what I say. It wouldn't be anything but your very spirit in us that, that, that swells something up in our hearts and stirs us up for action and for a response today. Before we leave this room, would our hearts be changed? God, I, I, I want to fall more in love with you in the next few moments we have. That's my heart and that's my desire. Let it be true for every single person in this room. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Do you believe it, church, that he can do it? Say amen. Okay, we shall see. John chapter 15 is where we're out of this whole series. Verse 14, it says, You are my friends if you do what I command you. I remember the first time that I heard that. Jesus loves you. You're God's friend. I remember the first time that I heard that. And thinking, well, that makes sense. You're a friend of God if you do what he commands. I mean, it makes sense a little, but even if it doesn't at all to you, he's God and he can say whatever he wants to say, right? It doesn't matter if I approve of it. He's, he's God. But then I, I continue reading scripture and we read that, oh, but it's, it's by grace through faith that you receive salvation, not by works, okay? And also, those good works that you're trying to do this, like, juggling act of, like, your good outweighs your bad, and hopefully, like, the Lord sees the good and doesn't see the bad somehow, all those good deeds, the best thing that you've ever done is, like, filthy rags, the Bible says, compared to the perfection of God and his holiness and his righteousness. It says, any of your good deeds are, are filthy rags compared to his goodness. So because of that, it's only by grace through your faith that you can be saved, not by works. But then it says, okay, but be my friend, and I'll call you that if you do what I command. And so if we're not careful, it feels like this really strange like almost it's, it's going, they're going against each other, right? It's this strange paradox that I, I'm, I think, at least the way that I grew up, it, it feels like they're contradicting each other to the point that we almost just want to go past it because it's like, I, I don't fully understand it. And so then the idea of becoming a friend of God just gets reduced down to a bumper sticker. And Jesus loves you, but without knowing it, for me, this is my story, without knowing it, that overlooking of that passage, of what does that actually look like, how is that walked out, 
that did something to me. Because I knew that Jesus loved me because the Bible tells me so. I knew that. But the Bible also says follow his commands. And so I, I, I felt the need, I have to move past this Jesus loves you stuff because I gotta go out and do stuff to, to make him happy. And then there was a deeper part of me that honestly was only revealed as I was preparing for this message that there was a part of my heart for so long that, that believed that God loved me, sure, but it wasn't out of desire, it was more of because he had to, because that's who he is. It was, does he desire it, or does, like, God loves his children, and so he has to love me, because I've made mistakes, and I have fallen, and I have stumbled, and so it's more of this, I love you, because I have to, because you're my kid, but, you know, I just, I don't desire it, and that was in me, because I didn't understand this dichotomy, Sometimes our underlying beliefs are so subtle that we don't know that they're there. That's the whole idea of being deceived is we don't know that it's happening. But it informs the way that we live without even knowing it. So maybe you're there too. Maybe you've been there before. Or maybe you're on the complete other side of this idea where it's like, I go to work tomorrow at eight in the morning and I just... This friend of God idea just seems so lofty. I don't know what really to make of it. John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. In order to get a full picture of what God is saying, we've got to know the context. And so to pull out a verse and to highlight it can be great, but we must place it back into the context of what it's saying. So let's do that. I'm gonna read this whole section. They tell you when, when you're learning how to, how to preach, I guess, they, they'll say, don't read too much scripture at once because you'll lose them. But I believe that this isn't just an ordinary book, but it carries power. And so I want to receive everything that it has to say, but also I want to receive all that he is through this. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read. 17 verses all at once, okay? But I, what I want you to do as I read this, I, I want you to ask yourself, does this sound like a list of do's and don'ts or, or a relationship out of mere obligation? Does it sound like that? John chapter 15 is where we're at. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it might bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you would bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples." Just as my Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit also should abide. So that whatever you ask 
The Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. I love that passage. Just the words that he uses. It feels nothing like do's and don'ts. Because there's love there. This verse about being friends, verse 14 being friends if we do what he commands, it's placed right in the middle of a love letter that's written to you. That's the context. And so this first phrase here, when he says, abide in me, your translation might say, remain in me. That word abide means to live. Abide in me, live in me. Live in me, live in me. That's kind of a strange thing to wrap our minds around. If you take it literally, at least. Just a couple weeks ago, my little nephew turned one. Uh, so we, Tori and I drove up to Columbus to celebrate and have his birthday party. My sister and her husband live up there. So this is my sister's first child. So it's very, very special. The party was decked out with all these decorations. She went all out for this first birthday. And I reminded her just because this is what brothers do that her child will not remember this, but it's more for her, you know, all this stuff. But no, maybe, maybe, maybe. Tori is convinced that she remembers her very first birthday cake. So maybe, maybe, maybe. But either way, this was a beautiful party. It was a beautiful celebration. He turned one. And I, I was thinking back to when she first told the family that she was pregnant. It was at Christmas time. And so she gave everybody a gift. And so I got this T-shirt that said, Cool Uncles Club, because, uh, you know. And <laughs> you're like, okay, Cool Uncles Club. And, and, then, she, and then she gave us this picture and this picture is called an ultrasound, right? But she passes this out, and she's like, here, here it is, you know? And I'm like, okay. So I'm looking at this black and white picture, and I'm like, oh, it's so, what am I looking at here? <laughs> like, I, you know how first ultrasound pictures can be, right? It's just like, I, this is great for you. I, I don't know what, you know. But, but as, as, the pregnancy, as her pregnancy progressed, she got another one. She actually got one of those 3D ones, which was cool really later, a, a lot later. But I, her next one was a, lot, was a lot better because her next ultrasound, farther along, she, I could, she showed me and I could see the actual, the, the, the baby had bigger features. It was more defined so you could see it in the, ultra, the black and white ultrasound. But what was crazier was that you could actually see, the baby was like this, and what you could see is like the actual umbilical cord that was attached to the baby that was attached to my sister and that was just such a wild thing to for it to show up on the picture because I'm like that child is literally connected like as living in your body and it's connected to you and the only thing keeping it alive is this connection between you as he lives in you and I'm like maybe that's kind of what it's like it's like maybe 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 we're just like a helpless infant in a womb where the only thing that's keeping us alive, the only thing that's keeping us breathing, but the only thing that's also like giving us hope is just this connection that we have with our Father. Abide in me, live in me. And then he says, and I'll live in you. And it's just gonna be this back and forth reciprocal love relationship where you receive my love, you say yes to me, and you pour all your love and affection back on me. And it's just this special thing that we have. And just like a newborn infant, I will sustain you. I will nourish you. Just come and I'll protect you. Old Testament says, come under my wing, under my protection. So he says, when you're living in me, I'm living in you. And, and out of this, there's going to be this love, this love response then that, that it, deep within your heart invokes this response that's not out of obligation, but it's just gonna boil out over you where you're just like, oh, you're my one thing. I'll do whatever you say because I love you. And he says, I'll call you friend then. Jesus is saying your obedience 
is not out of obligation, but it's a natural response to my love. And so here's the reality. If we want to understand, if we want to be a part of this story as a friend of God, we have to know his love. We have to know it. This Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Sure, we have to know it. It's our understanding of God's perfect and powerful love that is the beginning and the foundations of friendship. Amen? Let's keep going. I'll tell you something that happened just this past week. So I was, I was this, is, this never happens. This is why I'm sharing it. Well, I can't say it never happens because it happened. But this happened, and it very rarely happens. And so I wanted to share it with you. This past week, I was trying to figure out how we were going to wrap up this series. And I love the story of Abraham. Caleb inspired me. He did such a good job talking about Abraham. And I'm like, man, I'm going to throw it back to Abraham. But then I was like, no, I'll talk about Moses and Abraham because both of those stories kind of align. But then I was like, oh, but Mary of Bethany. And then I was like, at some point, I was like, I might just talk about every single person we've talked about the entire series. But then I realized that you probably I don't want to be here till seven o'clock at night. And so I was like, every thought or idea that I had just, it didn't seem right because it seemed like it, it, it was making sense in my brain, but it didn't feel like it was from the Lord. And that's, that's, what I, that's what I want. That's what I desire. And so I went to bed that night. I can't remember what night, Monday or Tuesday. I felt I was really tired, but I was also really discouraged. And so I prayed this one sentence prayer that I could muster up. And it was, Lord, give me rest and give me revelation. <laughs> like, give me rest and give me revelation. And I closed my eyes and fell asleep. Okay, the next morning, I woke up. And let me just say, I had faith that he could do that, but I my faith was pretty minimal that it was going to happen. I'll just be completely honest with you. And the next morning, I I woke up without an alarm, which is crazy, if you know me, and woke up without without an alarm, and in my head was this sentence, almost like a tape recorder playing over and over and over again. The love of Christ compels you. The love of Christ compels you. And I'm like, that's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. And so, but I, I knew it was in the Bible, but I couldn't, I couldn't remember the, like, the actual reference for it. So I looked it up. And that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And, and so I knew of that passage as a standalone verse or whatever, but I saw it in a new light in the context of John 15. That's what I feel like the Lord gave me. So we're going to go there. Amen? Can we do it? Let's do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Christ's love, it says, Christ's love controls you. Or your translation might say, Christ's love compels you. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them, for you. Christ's love controls me. Other translations, Christ's love compels me. That word compel is like, it's supposed to invoke this imagery of rushing water in between two riverbanks where anything in its way just washes over you. It compels, it controls everything in its path. The New English Bible translation says, it's the love of Christ that leaves me no choice. That everything was motivated by the love of Christ. And so we come to see in 2 Corinthians 5, when we put it in the context and the lens of John 15, that friends of God then are motivated, controlled by love. And so I look at my own life and I go, okay, how much of what I do, how much of what I've done am I doing, how much can I say is controlled by the love of Christ? Because I think, I think we can just get used to just doing things. Even if it's in the name of Jesus, we're doing ministry or we're 
leading gatherings or we're praying for people or we're evangelizing or we're feeding them, whatever it is, even if it's like in the name of Jesus, is it the love of Christ that's boiling out of your heart that just makes you go and do those things? Or does it feel like just your responsibility or the right thing to do as a good Christian? See, this is, this is the difference this is big because this is, this is what makes the difference between going and feeding the hungry on Saturday morning and saying, I'm exhausted, I barely want to be here, and saying, I can't wait to feed God's children. There's nothing more that I want to do. This is the difference between, and this, this happened for me, of when you, when you give and when you tithe, it's, it's out of more mere obligation to please Almighty God. And it's like, it leaves you just feeling a little discouraged and honestly anxious of whether you're going to have enough for yourself. It leaves you from there to finding out that giving is the mo- one of the most joyful spiritual practices you could ever do. It's the difference, but that's, that's the difference, and that's not something that you can do up here. It's something that the love of Christ has to compel you, control you, has to leave you no choice. There's no other choice that I have than to do these things out of love for my Father. This is big, to know the love of Christ so deeply that we enjoy the love of Christ so much that that's why we do everything that we do. This is what compels us to walk in friendship and obedience with him. This is what it is. Because God's heart from the very, very beginning, God's heart has been set on being with his creation. From the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, from the moment that God was walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, his desire, his heartbeat was to walk with his children. He wanted nothing more, nothing less. And then sin entered the picture. And everything changed. And Adam and Eve thought that they could cut their own cord and do it on their own. But even in that moment, God didn't give up, did he? Rather, it stirred up in God's heart this relentless pursuit to bring you back, to restore what was lost. But only the creator can heal his creation because there was no good work, there was no sacrifice that could fully restore what God's heart longed for since the very beginning. So he did the unthinkable. First John chapter four says this. So God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. See, God's love did not begin on the cross. It didn't start there. This is what he's always desired. The cross was a response of his love for you. It didn't start there. That was his love in action. But because of the cross, every sin past, present, and future, has been washed clean by his blood. You have access, the veil was torn, you have access to the very presence of God now, to hear his voice clearly, as Moses did. And you're invited to step into that love and to live in it. And this this cross and the blood and his sacrifice and his love, this is not something that we move on from to get to a a greater thing or a different subject. This is not something that we move past because this is child's play. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. The cross and his blood, his sacrifice and his love is something that we never move on from. It's something that we live in. Amen? Here's an important truth for you this morning. 
is that the love of God is not something that is achieved, but is received. It's received. Now, this love forms the foundations of friendship with him. It stirs something up inside of you that when you receive him, when you say yes to the cross, yes to what he did for you, and you say, I don't, I don't just believe in you. I want to follow you out of this new love that began with him. You say yes to his invitation to come and follow me. You say yes to that, and it's like, I'll follow you wherever you go. You are my one thing. This isn't just something I sing about. This isn't something just I know from my childhood. This isn't just something that I read about, but this is something that has transformed every part of me. Better is one day in your courts, in your house, than a thousand days elsewhere. The only way that we know that and walk in friendship in that is when we're controlled by his love. So how do we get to the point where it's really from pure love? Because it sounds good, but how do we do that? Tomorrow's Monday, I go to work, I do the things that I have to do, the kids are hungry, all this stuff, and I get distracted. How do I operate out of a place of love? Because it sounds great, but how do I do it? There's four passages, four verses that I think will help us. They've helped me anyway. One of them is 1 Peter chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. It says, like newborn infants, they long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up in salvation, if indeed you have tested that the Lord, tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Before, before I move on, I, when, when, when the Lord's love controls you, you, you're going to live in a way where people are confused by what you do. And you might be rejected. But take heart, because in the sight of God, you're chosen and precious. That's enough for me. And I, I used to think that this passage was only talking about, about this book, about, about the word of God. Because earlier in chapter one, it kind of references that. But throughout, throughout the couple of chapters in First Peter, it doesn't separate God's word from God. Because you can't separate God and what he says. His word is who he is. And so you can't separate it. And so in this passage, he's saying, like newborn babies, they long for pure spiritual milk. And so I'm on this train of thought. And like I said, my nephew just turned one. So I'm on this train of thought. When, we, when Tori and I first met him, it was just a couple days after he was born. We went to the hospital. We gave her some time. But we're like, we want to see this baby. And so we, we visited in the hospital. And when, when we walked in the room, she was feeding her baby. And I just got to thinking how crazy it is that this child was literally like underwater for months, attached by this weird thing that I saw in the black and white picture that's like, this is the only thing that's keeping you alive. And you're like underwater for months. And then you come out and you just know what to do. Like my sister didn't have to take him through a class or a course or teach him how to latch on and, and get nourishment. He just knew. And I'm like, how did he know? It was, it was strange. And I was just thinking, for him, that's the most natural thing to do is to continue to find nourishment. And so for us, the most natural thing for us when we're born again is to immediately latch on into the presence of God, desire and crave the presence of God, and to long to connect with him. 
That, that should be our inmost desire when we're born again. It's like, I've tasted and I've seen, and that's all I want for the rest of my life. But too often, that's not what's taught. Instead, it's like, okay, now you become a new believer. Congratulations. And for me, it was, okay, now go through confirmation, which was this year-long course. And, and then after confirmation, then you can start taking communion. And then you can start taking, you can go into this next class. It's like better than Sunday school. You can do all these things. You can be a part of these Bible studies. And then after that, you're going to take this class and this class and this. And all those things can be really, really good. But I feel like sometimes we don't believe that really in our hearts when we become reborn as new believers, our desire is to be with him. Too, too quickly do we try to feed people formula and, and give them a bottle of, oh, listen to this podcast that'll teach you about that, or oh, be a part of these nine Bible studies and do all these things. And those things are great, but we forget that like it's our desire to be with him. We can go right into his presence. It, it's got to be both. Otherwise, it only lands here and we miss out on so much. The second verse is Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. It says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I love that verse. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I love it, but sometimes I'm like, do we really, do I really believe that? That there are pleasures forevermore at his right hand? Because I, like, I, I think we all could agree that we believe that there are pleasures to be found in God. But is God really, really, is he better? Does he have more pleasures than going boating or going golfing or playing pickleball <laughs> because it says his pleasures are forever now God created pickleball holy and anointed so all of you people right around here it is God's gift to his green earth so it is anointed and so enjoy our gathering is currently addicted to pickleball and it's absolutely wild and they love it but but do we believe that at God's right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do we believe that? Because I think, at least for me, I've believed that at, at some level there's a cap to it. There's a limit. Which then what does that cause you to do? It goes, okay, I'm going to go find the next thrill. If you've been there, I promise you that there's more. Because I believe what it says. And this, this, this goes right back to John 15. John 15 says something similar. He says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Not three-fourths full, but full. His joy and his pleasures are forevermore. And if that's not something that we're experiencing, there's got to be more. That is good news. The third verse is Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. This is Paul. I love the book of Ephesians. <sighs> I could stay there forever. This is Paul, and he's praying for the church. He says, for this reason... For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being or inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now think about this. Paul, in my book, the greatest missionary on earth. 
He says, I'm on my knees for you, church. You're already believers. That's not the issue. He says, I'm just asking God that, that he would give you strength, give you the strength to even attempt to comprehend with all of the saints in the room because maybe something happens when two or more are gathered. Maybe, maybe something happens in the spirit that you gain even a fuller understanding when you're with the saints in community with one another that I'm just praying and begging God that he would, he would through his spirit, give you the power to maybe even just comprehend his love. But he's like, this, isn't, this is not something that I can just teach you or shove you through a class to understand. Those things are good, but this is something that the power of God has to put in you because this goes beyond knowledge. So would they get it, God? Would, they, would the church get it? How much, that they're, how, how much they're loved by your perfect and holy and righteous love? Would they understand it to a point that it pierces their inmost being? Paul says it's going to take a miracle. That's why he's on his knees praying to God that they would give even the strength to begin this journey. I think part of why he's praying that is because he knows how bad we are receiving love sometimes. A lot of us growing up did things in order to gain approval from our parents or from our guardians. But approval is much different than love. You, you can't earn your parents' love. But a lot of us grew up combining those two things, approval and love. And so that translates in those subtle ways on how we view God of, of his love. Okay, his approval and his love are the same thing. And so I, I have to do these works and my good has to outweigh my bad to, to, to live in his love. And he loves me, but it might be out of obligation. And so this week I feel really loved by the Lord because I did all these things. And next week I stumbled. And so this, this, this roller coaster that I think so many of us, I myself, have been on. Because we're not always the best at receiving love, let alone perfect love. Or maybe you grew up with not much love at all. And so receiving this overwhelming love that changes how you live, changes your inner being, is just this, it's just this strange idea that you've never really ever tasted. But it's a much better way to live. Here's the last one. And I'm going to invite the worship team. We're going to close out uh, in response because I, I think we've, we've learned a lot of the stories. We've learned a lot of the points. We've, we've heard all the things. Uh, but as we tie a bow on this series, being a friend of God is all about our response. It's, it's oh my gosh, the cross did that. He did that for me. He sent himself to earth to die for me. And now I'm covered and washed clean in his blood. And now I get to just live in that love as he lives in me and I live in him. And it's just this reciprocal relationship. And he says, and, and from this reciprocal relationship that you have with me, you're just going to be bubbling up in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's going to inform how you live. And you're going to follow me. You're going to obey all I command. And you're going to be my friend. If that doesn't leave you stunned. But being a friend is, is a response to his love. It's saying yes to the, to, the, to the invitation of, hey, come and follow me. Not those who are qualified. The disciples were just a bunch of fishermen and most of them weren't even good at that. Right? Right? But he looked at them, he said, come and follow me. Be my friend. And they said, yes. It's more than up here. It's a response out of what's happening in here. Here's the last one. Romans chapter five, verse five. It says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I felt the spirit on that one. God has poured into our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit. God's love has been poured into our hearts. I, could we actually have the prayer team come up now so that we don't get distracted uh, later? We love you, but just come on up now. Just hang out with me and the team, and you guys can just start playing. I want to I wanna end with this. I feel like this is where the Spirit's taking us. And so hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So Paul in Ephesians says that this love is beyond comprehension. You can't just know it. You can draw it out on a diagram. You can try to map it out. But until it's in here and has pierced every part of you, just like it pierced the blood of Jesus on the cross, until it pierces you, you're not going to get it. And so he's praying on his knees. And, and what Romans 5 says is that it's much more supernatural than just knowing it or mapping it out or trying to figure it out through a song you learned at VBS. He says the Holy Spirit actually pours the love of Christ directly into your heart. But that's different from how I was originally taught because I've heard it said like, okay, first it gets in your, in your head and then it makes the 18 inch transition. All the pastors say this, like it makes the 18 inch transition from your head to your heart. And so I'm like, okay, so I know that Jesus loves me and I gotta get it into my head. Like, uh, uh, uh. I gotta bang it into my head. And then somehow I guess just let gravity do its work and just like jiggle down to my heart. But that's not what it says. It's like, no, there's something way better that happens. It's not by anything that you do, but the Holy Spirit can actually pour it right into your heart. Paul's like, I know that these people, these believers could be doing all these things and they could, they could do all these things, they could read all these things, but they could still not get it. And so I'm, open, I'm opening my heart to the Lord and saying, would you open our eyes, but not of our head, but open the eyes of our heart, enlighten the eyes of our heart that we may see your true and pure and holy love. And would you pour it through your spirit directly into our hearts so that it may transform us to the point where it controls us, where it leaves us no choice than to respond out of love back and say, I will follow you. I will obey everything that you command in this book because I love you and there's nothing that I want more. So do you believe that like a newborn baby, those of you, those of us who believe can immediately connect with him right now. Not on the way home, not pushing it off. Not maybe next week, I'll get it, I'll get it in, maybe. No, do you believe that through his love and through his grace, that he made a way for you to literally connect with him right now, maybe for the first time ever? Like a newborn baby who can't do anything on their own. You can just attach on to his presence. You can become one with him. Do you believe that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore? That there's so much joy to be had that it could fill you up? That he's not asking you to do something that's boring, but that this gives you life and that there's no limit? Do you believe how wide, like Paul was saying, how wide, how long, how high, how deep, that God could love you a million times more than you've ever loved anybody? Do you actually believe that? And do you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to pour that out into your heart that when you walk out of the room, you're forever changed? That's what he offers us. Would you stand with me? He offers it and he paid for it by the cross. This is a covenant relationship. This is no contract. We're not his employees. This is love. And out of this love becomes 
this position that we are in to make a choice and to respond. Because we can learn about it for seven weeks in a row. We can hear the stories of other people who have done it. But now he says, I'm offering you the invitation to say yes to coming and to follow me. And so the prayer team is up here. And I want to offer you the invitation that if you've never said yes to not just believing, but to knowing the love of God and to saying yes to following him for all the days of your life, if you never really said yes to that, I would invite you to come forward and receive prayer and we'll walk you through saying yes to Jesus. You can go ahead, if that's you, you can come on up now. If you're someone in the room like, and this is the place that I've found myself throughout my life, is that you go on this roller coaster back and forth of, I think he loves me this week. I don't think he loves me this week because I was into this or whatever. If you've been on this roller coaster and you're in a season of life where you're just like, man, I've lost that connection to love. I've lost that connection to him. How do I know I've lost it? Because nothing in here compels me to do what I do. It's out of responsibility, it's out of obligation. And so if you're finding yourself there this morning, that's okay, we've been there, I've been there, but I wanna invite you to come forward and say yes to reconnecting with Jesus. He paid for this. So I don't wanna take it casually. I, I, I don't wanna say, oh, well, I, I don't wanna come up front because it's a, it's a little strange. Like he paid a really costly price for this and it's free. So come up and receive prayer for that. Or if you're someone who that Romans 5, that, that pouring his love directly into your heart, maybe for the first time or once again, that Romans 5, if, if that stirred something in your heart, it's like, man, that's what I want. That's what I need because it's been up here for a long time, but I need a fresh touch of his love. I need a fresh pouring out of his spirit. I've been a believer for a long time, but I wanna be rebaptized over and over in his love. I want his love to be poured right into my heart. Would you baptize me in your Holy Spirit? I wanna invite you to come forward and receive a fresh touch from the Spirit of God. The veil was torn and you have direct access into the presence of God. And so we would love to just lay hands on you and bless what God is already doing. If he's stirring in your heart something, if it's starting to bubble up, if you've got the goosebumps or whatever, I'd encourage you, please come up so we can bless what he's doing and say more, Lord, come Holy Spirit, pour your love into their heart. So if that's you, I would like to invite you to come forward right now. We're gonna go back into singing just for a little bit and then I'll close us out in prayer. But I don't want you to miss this chance. We can do series after series after series after series and we can learn all there is to learn. But to know the love of God is to begin friendship with him and it changes everything that we do. It controls everything that we do. If that's not you right now, come up and say yes to that. Or just say, Holy Spirit, I need it again. Would you pour into me? Would you baptize me in your spirit and in your love? So that's the invitation. So those of you whose hearts are being stirred in those ways, come forward. We're going to sing and we'll close out in prayer. Our prayer team this morning, God, if you're up here, you can continue praying. Just more Holy Spirit. But our, our prayer team, somebody on our prayer team got a word of knowledge prophetic word for your, someone or maybe many people in this room, but I wanted to not move on until I shared it and then I'll pray us out this morning. But it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But the word is that God himself, God is worthy of laying down all unworthies. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, Shall we provoke Jesus to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And the word of knowledge is that he is jealous for his church. He is jealous for you. He's jealous for me. From the very beginning, this is what his heart desires, is to be with you. 
And so, so shall we provoke Jesus to jealousy. He is worth laying down all other things that are found unworthy because he alone is worthy. So would you pray in that light with me? Father, all things on earth that we see with our eyes and that we experience with our hands and that we can touch, none of it compares to the goodness of who you are and the goodness of your love. And so, Spirit of God, I would ask that you would stir our hearts and move in our hearts and enlighten the eyes of our hearts to see that this is what you've always desired. This is all what you've always desired from me, from you. God, this is your one desire that we would abide in you and, uh, and you in us and that we would love you with all the things in us. That we would pour out our love on you. That is your first and greatest command. And the one is like it, that we would love others out of the overflow of that, that we would be compelled by your love. God, would you do that in our hearts, Holy Spirit, that you would take control of our inner man. You would take control of our hearts, that we would be compelled, we would be controlled, and we would be left with no choice than to love others because we have found the one who loves us. Thank you, Jesus, for the price that that costs. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood and for the cross. This isn't something that I want to walk out of, that I want to move away from, but this is the place that I want to live, that Christ in him crucified is more than enough, that that's the message of love that compels me to live in a way that is being able to be called your friend, that obeys all that you've commanded us to do. It's from this place of love. So, Father, I pray that your spirit would pour it out into our hearts and that we would come to know that nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing on earth, nothing in heaven can separate us from your love. Not our good deeds, not our good works, not our accomplishments, not our failures, not when we stumble, not the roadblocks that we stub our toe into. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So Holy Spirit, would you pour it out into our hearts directly that we may know the height and the depth and the length and the width that your love is for us. God, that we would be able to just begin to comprehend what the cross means, what your blood covers. Jesus, would you pour out your spirit? Would you baptize us in your Holy Spirit? Would you pour out your love on us that we may leave this room completely changed, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing. Making the choice to follow Jesus is to lay down all unworthy things, is to live a life of givenness and surrender for Jesus. But this is the decision that changes everything. It changes everything. It changes everything for you and your heart. It changes everything for your family, for your children, for your spouse. It breaks generational curses and it frees you from the things that you've grown up believing, but you've been deceived about the love of Christ. It breaks these curses that have been placed on you and it sets you free. This is the power of the love of Christ. And so for the sake of our own hearts and for the sake of the generations to come, Lord, we pray and we say yes to following you. We say yes to your holy and your perfect love. We say yes to following all the things that you command of us. 
We say yes to loving you back. We say yes to loving our neighbor in the same way. We say yes to living differently because we are controlled by your love. This is what changes everything. And it's by your power and your love that it's even possible for us. How grateful, how thankful I am that your desire is to be with us and that you desire to pour out your love in a way that really does change our hearts, transforms us from the inside out. What a gift you are, Jesus. I never want to move on from this. I never want to move on from you. Your pleasures are forevermore. And I thank you, Lord. God, we give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We give you our families. We give you our money. We give you everything. Because better is one day right here than a thousand days elsewhere. We give it all to you in love and we receive your love back. Thank you, Jesus. In his name we pray and everybody said amen. Uh, can we seal that off with some praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So I want to invite you if the Lord is stirring your heart to come forward, the prayer team will stay up here and receive prayer for an outpouring of the Spirit right into your heart. It's available to you. So come on up, receive that. Otherwise, have a great Sunday. And I hope you live differently because of the Lord's love for you.